In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I'm happy to see a lot of you coming and uh, following with uh, our uh, Savior, or as we uh, said, our Bridegroom. As we said yesterday, that these few nights are called the Bridegroom services, and this icon that you see is the icon of the suffering Bridegroom, who's coming to uh, uh, buy his bride and to pay the price for her uh, in order to acquire her uh, to himself. According to Ephesians 5, when he says, Husbands, love your wives. As Christ also loved the church and gave his life for her. He didn't give just a price for the church, but the price was his blood, was his life. So as we are following the footsteps of our Savior, because we have salvation in His passion, in His sufferings, in what He was doing. Today was a, um, a landmark also in 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 the in the in the cross, the path of the cross, well, the, where the Lord had a busy and f full day yesterday, and slept in in Bethany, which is a small city. Uh, next to Jerusalem, and um, he spent the night in Bethany and came in the morning again to the temple to pray because it's, a, it's, it's holy days, and as I told you, so many people come from all over the world to worship in a temple in Jerusalem. Apparently, Jesus didn't even eat the whole day yesterday, so in the morning, he was hungry, passed by a fig tree, and expecting to see roots because the leaves were big and uh, gave a signal that there is uh, some fruit but he couldn't find any fruit in that fig tree and he did something that he never did before never in his ministry in his teaching he cursed the tree he cursed the tree and said that's it no one will eat from your fruit again coming back after visiting the temple the disciples saw the tree as a, a, a complete shock and dead like over no time and they said master look at the tree that you cursed this morning because even the tree if you if you if you stop feeding the tree or there is hot weather it takes like few days to dry up but it dried up uh, uh, you know same day and they said master look at this and he said let you if you have faith you can even move mountains the biggest second event that he did, he cleansed the temple. He went in the temple, and as you know, uh, everybody's coming from all over the world to offer sacrifices, the Paschal Lamb, and they bring the sacrifices to the priests, and the priests examine them. And if the priests find that there is any fault in the sacrifice they're bringing, they actually reject it. And people came all the way, they have to offer sacrifice, so what do they do? They sell what they have in a very cheap price, and they buy something good from the temple for something very expensive. And as, as, as I told you, uh, uh, Josephus, uh, the historian, said that there is almost two and a half million Jew in Jerusalem during this time. Everybody's buying and selling, and it's a, it's a big chaos. And Jesus was very, very mad because, of course, it's a, it's a big game between the priests and the people who are selling the doves and the, and the sacrifices. So the priests reject their sacrifices, and then they go and buy from the people who have their selling uh, place in the temple or in the temple area. So of course, the Lord Jesus could not take that. And he did also something that he hasn't done before in a very serious way. He threw away everything and drove all these people who were selling and buying out of the temple completely and he said this is a house of prayer and you made it a house of merchandise connecting all uh, these events together today is the day of the uncovering in order for the bridegroom who is coming to marry his bride there need to be openness because the openness will make closeness. 
the openness between the bride, which is us, the church, and the bridegroom, which is Christ, if there is no openness, there is no unity. And the Lord is saying, take out the masks, take out everything that cover up the real situation, and let's deal openly and honestly. Away with hypocrisy. And today in the morning, we read Genesis from the beginning, Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing that came to their mind, not we should go to God and say, help us. We did the wrong thing and we ate what you told us not to eat. Help us. But they didn't do that. What did they do? Covered up. Felt like they're naked. They took fig leaves, same thing, fig tree, fig leaves, covered up, said, uh, we think everything is okay. Everything is okay. And then God, of course, Adam, where are you? said, uh, I was naked, so I was making some clothes and stuff like this. What are you doing? Did you eat from the tree? God is the one who asked him, did you? And of course, Adam said the very famous word, no, not me, it's the wife you gave me. She's the source of all problems, you know. And you too, because you gave, you know, such an evil woman to me. <laughs> Yesterday, in the creation, he said, this is a bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And now, something else, covering up. Today is the day of the uncovering. Believe it or not, this is actually an icon of a bridegroom. This is his tuxedo. The purple robe that we put on him. But it's somehow not complete. He's half naked. And on the cross, he's almost naked. Why? Why did he choose that? He said, Adam, I know your problem. You and all your children, you need to look good. Right? Especially in front of people. I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to look horrible in front of the whole world. Even till now. Jesus was not exposed and was naked on the cross just in front of the few uh, hundreds of thousands of people around, but in front of millions, every day we see him on the cross. He's naked on the cross. Why? Adam uncovers. I'm coming to be naked for you. That you, I'm going to come as a baby. I'm going to come as a mere human being. I'm coming in a very, very, very humble way that you can learn from me to be humble and lowly and open your heart to me. I am coming not for a war. I'm not coming not to judge you. I'm coming to marry you. I'm coming for a closeness. We said that this is the time preparing for that. What's going to happen on Thursday? Thursday, that? Proposal. Proposal. Very good. Some people are awake. The proposal that he's going to do. But let's be open. Let's be transparent. Here I am, the bridegroom. I'm naked. I'm weak. I'm poor. I'm exposed and examined. By the way, the Paschal lamb, when they bring it, they have to bring it to the temple four days before and put it under an inspection or under watching because they have to offer like a, a perfect lamb. So maybe the lamb has like a, a fever or a cold or anything like this. So over four days, it will be clear. You know, if there is anything, you know, no, we need a perfect lamb. So the rule is actually the feast, the Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, the, the Hebrew month. So they bring the lamb on the 10th, which is Palm Sunday and bring it to be under examination. And the Lord was under severe examination during this time. 
by the scribes and Pharisees and the questions and this and the taxes and Caesar and the Sadducees and the resurrection. Most of the difficult questions you read in the Bible were asked during these few days. Our bridegroom is exposed, is examined, and telling us, here I am. Why don't you do the same? I'm not coming to judge you, but I'm coming to heal you. Imagine you go to the doctor and tell him, I cannot uncover where it hurts. You have to discover. You're a smart doctor. You should know these things, right? You go to school, you, you know, you're paid well. You should know these things. Can't. And this is something very, very, very important. That the Lord will never, ever heal something that is not exposed, that it's not offered to Him. I cannot say, the Lord, you know everything. Yes, I do know everything. But I can never impose myself on you. Unless you ask me, Lord, this hurts. Please heal that. I will never be able to heal it. So we will never be able to combine, unite with the master and get the healer to heal every wound unless it is exposed. Part of the fellowship of his suffering and joining the Lord Jesus Christ tonight is also being exposed and uncovered. Uncovering the heart, the hidden parts of the heart. There is no disease that is too bad or too tough for the Lord to heal. Except that covering up. This is the only disease that the Lord cannot heal. I'll give you an example. You know, when the early Christians in the book of Acts, they started believing, they brought their money to the, 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 the apostles, and the apostles gave to everyone. And a lot of people, sinners, they sold their stuff, and they brought everything to the apostles. A lot of people repented. A lot of people did horrible things. Horrible things. Repented, come back, no problem. Except a couple. Ananias and Sapphira. Hananiah and Sapphira. They sold their land, covered up, made themselves look nice and fancy like other Christians who gave everything and they said, we give everything. You give everything? Are you sure? It's your money. You can say, I just want to give half. That's more than enough. No, 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 we gave everything. Sure, you gave everything. Yes, we gave everything. Okay, now you leave. You die right now. And both of them drop dead. Severe. I'm telling you now, some severe actions. One of them, cursing the fig tree. Second one, cleansing the temple. Story of Ananias and Sapphira. All of these are severe examples. Like you don't find anything else like them. Never ever happened in the history of the church, the book of Acts, that they said to anyone, you drop dead now. Never ever that Jesus cursed anything. Never ever that he acted in a, in a violent way like this in the temple. It's the one disease that cannot be healed, which is the covering up. And it's the one thing that will separate me from my bridegroom. Because we're not transparent. We don't know each other. It's the one thing that will come that will make him tell me in the end, God forbid, tell me or tell anyone, to be honest with you, I do not know you. Why? Covering up. I'm tempted to tell you a joke. <laughs> Should I? Okay. So uh, a lady got into a car accident. And she almost went to heaven. And then God sent her back and said, Not your time now. You have 15 years to live. 15 years. Great. She went and 
She did a lot of skin work and straightened like her skin and everything and she looked very beautiful because she has 15 years to live. And then a month later after all of this she got into a car accident again and she died. She went to God, didn't you tell me 15 years? He said, sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Something like that. I do not know you. You're covering up. You have a mask. You look different. You're not yourself. <clears throat> we all have this fear of exposure. Expose ourselves. We have a fear of rejection and, and, and being cast out because, um, because of our sins, because of our weaknesses. A lot of us we're brought in an environment we can't even express our feelings. Can't express our feelings, our emotions, what we feel. Can't apologize. <clears throat> Very hard to expose because when I expose what's, what's in there, I'm made fun of or I, I, I'm belittled or anything like this. So there is a, a, a huge problem with opening up which is fine with people to some extent. But when I continue to live this covering up, especially with the busy life we have, the, the busy life we live, it's very, very easy to just live on the outside and put a mask all day and all night. And then there's a huge separation between you and your bridegroom. And then the love relationship is not there. And the pr prayer is lukewarm. And I don't understand what God is doing in my life. It's all because of this covering up. It's the one thing that Jesus hates. Never Jesus told anyone, would to you, except the scribes and Pharisees, who lived a perfect life on the outside, but covered up the inside too well. And they lived that double life. The fear of exposure. The Lord, the fathers of the church said they didn't believe in self-examination where you sit with yourself and say I did this wrong and I did that wrong and I did this wrong and that wrong. Fathers of the church never believed in that. But they believed in opening up your heart and your sins in the presence of your heavenly father who is embracing you who is telling you, sure, go ahead, tell me everything, worry not, don't filter anything, get everything out. Lord, this is this, and this is what I'm feeling, and, and can you believe that when I see people uh, uh, succeeding or, or having good time, I feel sad? Lord, can you believe that? I, I can't believe that my heart is that dirty and, and, and evil. He said, I will heal you. When you expose, I will heal. Lord, can you believe that even in the holy places where I go to church, I have evil thoughts and, and bad imaginations and all of this? Sure, come, expose this. I will heal you. Ask for healing. Ask and you will receive. Lord, can you believe that after all these years, I still doubt you and I, I, I don't know who you are and I doubt your existence and I doubt your divinity? Sure. Lots of people do that. Open up. Don't shy away. Don't act like, you know, everything is okay. So during this week, our master is coming lowly and humbly, opening his arms and hands and saying, come to me. Nobody can be more weak than I am. I'm very weak and very humble. And I'm going to humble myself to a, a huge extent to draw you to me. Draw near to God. Come closer. What do you think the separation? Is it the mind? Is it the heart? Is it the thoughts? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the doubts? Come and open all of this in order to get unity with the bridegroom. One of the things that make us not open up 
and really have a separation between us and God, when we separate what happens in our daily life from our spiritual life. So our spiritual life, the prayer is going, the going to church, the reading the Bible, like the scribes and Pharisees. They did everything prayer-wise, perfect. But their actions were full of envy, with, with full of greediness, they loved the money more than anything else. Make no mistake about it. They gave their tithe. But they loved money to a point that they would take the money from a widow. Jesus said, do you have heart? You're taking money of the widows and the orphans? How much your heart is hardened? Because they separated worship from practical life from what they do. That's a big, big problem, actually, that the devil is feeding in us day in and day out. And I, I, It really hurts me when some people come and say, I've been praying so long about something and nothing has been happening. As the prayer is this, and the practical life is just going so bad, and, and in the end, I stop prayer because there's no connection. But the opening up would show that every single action happening in my life reflects what's in my heart. Yes, I could do all my prayers, but the anger that I show my family shows very well that God is not present inside. Something is missing. This anger can never be from God. Something wrong with this prayer. This prayer must be turned into, Lord, why am I that angry? Can you heal me? Versus, Lord, when will you ever avenge against my enemies and those who are making me angry? When will you listen to my prayers and make these people stop making me angry? Wrong prayer. I'm making you angry for a reason. I want you to see what's in your heart. Because otherwise, there is a separation between you and me. Why does it happen is, the more I pray, when I start to pray and going to church and fasting, bad things start happening. Yes, they are connected to each other. God is telling you, really? You want to fast? Excellent. Let me show you what you need to fast for. And everything goes wrong in your life. Super. God is showing you what's going on. But we have a separation, lack of faith, as God is the shopping list and life is something else. And once we do this separation, we also live separate from God, from knowing Him, from being close, from understanding His will. Every single action happened in my day is controlled by my Heavenly Father who cares for me, who's showing me What's happening in my life? What's wrong with me? He's the one who's putting this boss at my work to get the lying out of me. To get how I'm a people pleaser. To get the worst out of me. Why? Not to expose me and not to put me down, but to heal me. To go and tell him, Lord, can you take away my boss? No. Lord, why am I angry? Expose me, Lord. I have a lot of fears, a lot of lack of uh, 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 unbelief. I have a lot of people pleasing in my heart. Lord, would you heal that? Sure. You expose, I heal. So one of the biggest things is separating what's happening in, in life uh, from uh, uh, spiritual life. The second thing is also blaming God and blaming others and always focusing on what's wrong around me and how people around me, you know, they're, they're doing, you know, the exact opposite of what I like. People always pushing my buttons. Guess what? God is the one who put these people in your life and if they leave, other people will come and push the same buttons or even worse. Right? 
is a worse boss? So, God is the one who's putting these things. God is the one who's putting us as a family together when we get on each other's nerves. God knows how much I learned from my children, more than what I learned from all the books in my life. Not their teaching, but their misbehavior taught me, you know, how impatient I am, how unforgiving, unloving, negative they taught me more than anyone else. Thank God for every naughtiness. Thank God for every misbehavior. That's not an okay for the kids to misbehave, though. <laughs> you know, but God is putting everyone in my life to expose, to open. Imagine everything in your life. The goal is to open up that the Lord, the healer, the bridegroom would come and heal. That's what it says in Ephesians that he might sanctify the church, might sanctify her, and make her perfect. I don't want to scare you, but I have to say that. The bridegroom will never marry the bride unless she matches him. If she's not open, they can't get married. She's not humble like him, can't get married. I mean the bridegroom, our bridegroom. If they are not on the same page, can't get married. So now, he's saying, expose yourself. I will heal you so we can unite. We're all praying for this unity, for that peace that comes from above, from all the blessings of the bridegroom. And he's saying, I want to give you that, but expose. I'll conclude with one thing here. Is that we live a very distracted life. Very busy, very distracted. Busy with everything that's going on and distracted by gadgets, media, people, events, phones, alarms, due dates, all of this. And these two together, being busy and being distracted, are one of the major things that stop us from being exposed, open, and having this real, sincere relationship with our bridegroom. That's why the Lord gave the Sabbath. Sabbath was one day a week where people did not do anything. They sit at home and they are bored to death. So hopefully when they're bored to death, everything comes. Everything is exposed. They got a time to sit with themselves and to get to sit with the Lord. We break this commandment every single week. Right? Even though we come to church, but even at a church, you know, even on the Sabbath day, we're distracted. I'm not saying that to judge you or judge anyone, but we need to have a Sabbath for ourselves. You know, whether the Sabbath every night before I go to sleep, since you know that Archimedes Wright said that to, today in the morning, he said every day before you go to sleep, sit with yourselves and see what your guardian angel will present to God. Examine your day, not examine yourself. Rewind the day in the presence of God and put every action that did not please him that he may uncover what's happening on the heart and maybe cleanse the heart day after day. Day after day, I'm connected to my bridegroom. Day after day, no separation. Covering up one leaf after the other, one leaf after the other, one leaf after the other, they make a wall between me and God. Day after day, month after month, without sitting with myself 
or with God without any opening up between me and him make walls and the prayers are very dry and the relationship is just has no taste he said don't allow this to happen but day after day sit in his presence take communion after you had a little bit few minutes to expose the heart and say my bridegroom make me like you and transform me to your image as he is proposing with his life in that cup of blood so it's a chance for us during this holy week to quiet down as much as we can as much as we can to quiet down things to be in his presence more more prayers words just talking just opening up Stop all the alarms and the gadgets and all of these distractions for just a few time and be with him in his presence that you may uncover in order to be healed and to be ready for the wedding of the bridegroom. Glory be to God forever and ever. Let's stand up for the nighttime litanies.